Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. Um, we're going to uh, begin this uh, first session of the second day uh, on Nostra Tate. Uh, our speaker is John Borelli, who is really the spark plug behind this event. And uh, John is, is the uh, special assistant for interreligious initiatives to, to President John DeJoy, the president of Georgetown. And he's also coordinator for dialogue for the Jesuit Conference of the United States and Canada. Uh, John and I worked together uh, 25 years ago at the Bishop's Conference. He's the best colleague I've ever had. Uh, and I've heard, uh, uh, I've heard bits and pieces of this talk as he's made discoveries over the last uh, several years. And uh, I've been waiting to hear it all put together. So uh, without further ado, I'll give you John Morelli. Thank you very much, Drew. We have copies of Nostra Aetate, which uh, Andy and Sam have. If you don't have a copy, didn't pick up one, put your hand up, and he'll make sure right, and that you have a copy. Well, Drew, um, I'll spare you the full story. I could talk six hours on Nostra Aetate without repeating myself, but I won't. Um, it was one of the surprises even one of the miracles of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. It was unanticipated from the start. Pope John XXIII announced the council to the surprise of all, save a couple of his closest friends and his Secretary of State, Cardinal Domenico Tardini. It was met by stunned silence at a private gathering of cardinals in Rome in the chapter room of St. Paul outside the walls on January 25, 1959. The next day, the Vatican newspaper, L'Observatorio Romano, carried the announcement with these vague purposes, not only for the spiritual good and joy of the Christian people, but also to invite the separated communities to seek again that unity for which so many souls are longing in these days throughout the world. Eventually, Pope John would sort out these purposes, a means of spiritual renewal, reconciliation of the church to the modern world, and service to the unity of Christians. The last purpose in both listings, the unity of Christians, explains the significance of the feast of January 25th, the conversion of St. Paul, the close of the church unity octave, and significant for ecumenical relations. The elderly biblical scholar former rector of the Biblicum and confessor for, for Pope John's predecessor, Pius XII, Father Augustin Bea, set to work to put structure to the service of the unity of Christians. Eventually, Pope John made good on his ecumenical purpose by creating a secretariat for promoting Christian unity and making Bea its, a cardinal by then, its president. The announcement came on Pentecost 1960. And at that Pentecost announcement in St. Peter's was a young American priest, a member of the Congregation of St. Paul, or Paulist Fathers, Thomas F. Stransky, who was pleasantly surprised to hear the announcement of a secretary for promoting Christian unity and had no idea that in a couple of months, before he would turn 30, he would be invited on board the tiny but completely new staff. He, he is now 85. Working with him closely and learning to see the unfolding of Vatican II and the controversial Nostra Aetate through his eyes has been my work these past nine years. Father Stransky frames the problematic of Nostra Aetate and its questions this way. We have to face two temptations, to read back into the document a detailed program for the future and to study the document as an end product, a sterile set of 41 sentences stripped of their history and context. This short text had a complicated history and within it nearly every word had a role to play in that history. In the fitting together of its sentences, three strands, one major thread and two auxiliary ones, 
are wound making a tightly wrapped story of a church groping for where to begin and how much to say safely. On the 15th of October, 1965, at a news conference after the first round of final voting on Nostra Aetate, Father Stransky observed, what is said in the declaration may seem naive in centuries to come, but at the present, he said, it would be difficult for the council to come up with any more than it has. What put the document on the Jews later expanded to interreligious relations on the agenda was a 30-minute audience of the Holocaust survivor, French Jewish historian, Jules Isaac, with Pope John XXIII, just eight days after that 1960 Pentecost announcement. Isaac reports in his own account that Pope John thought of the idea of a commission in looking into what Isaac termed, termed the teaching of contempt for the Jews as soon as Isaac walked into the room. We also have evidence from Pope John's private secretary, now 100 years old, Cardinal Capavilla, that indeed that was the first moment the Pope thought about putting the question on the Jews on the agenda. And once that happened, he never gave up on the idea. Pope John directed Isaac to Cardinal Bea. They met two days later. That others were also at work to develop a positive statement towards Muslims would probably not have succeeded without the main thread of a statement on the Jews. That the bishops of Asia and Africa decided after the experience of the first fall 1962 session of the council that they wanted some official way to relate to the majority of religions surrounding their communities would never have succeeded without the main thread and a surprise factor. The election of Pope Paul VI allowed all these threads to be handed to Bea's secretariat because Paul VI already had a positive attitude towards Muslims, thanks to Louis Massignon, the premier Catholic scholar of Islam of the first half of the 20th century, and because he believed in dialogue, since he was a Francophile and read the Fr French Catholic intellectual tradition. Paul VI was the right person at the right time and expressed his willingness almost immediately to the bishops of Asia and Africa to act on their suggestion for another secretariat, one relating to all religions. Pope Paul was truly devoted to the collective ideas of the text, but in trying to help it, made mistakes, like a hot potato toss. Nostra Aetate survived because it declared only a minimum. In that sense, Nostra Aetate, while reversing church teaching, left nearly all questions unanswered. For nearly every topic it addressed, or addresses, there is a long list of unanswered questions. Nostra Aetate III on Muslims represented a real shift, though the framers would cite papal magisterium, a rather extraordinary letter of Gregory VII of the 11th century, offering remarkable resonances between Christian and Muslim faith. Never mind that his successor, Urban II, when calling the First Crusade, referred to Saracens, Muslims, as execrable. Unlike any course on post-biblical, unlike any course on post-biblical Judaism, one could find positive courses on Islam taught at pontifical institutions in Rome as early as 1924. Even Nostra Aetate II is remarkable for treating other religions as religions and not aspects of paganism. Curiously, while Nostra Aetate would eventually address contemporary relations with Muslims and the followers of other religions, it said next to nothing about rabbinic Judaism, a question not asked in the text. 
So three general areas need to be addressed. What were the questions that Nostra Aetate asked and answered? What were the questions that those at the time raised but it did not answer? And what were the questions that were implicit in its teachings and clearly in its future implementation and have only been asked afterwards? Now, at the questions asked and answered. At the first plenary of the Secretariat in November 1960, the tenth and last item on the agenda, sub secreto, and Stransky likes to say there's two secrets in Rome, one that's not very good and you forget, and the other one's really good and you tell. <laughs> so the tenth item was sub secreto, questiones de Judeus, which meant everybody in Rome soon, soon knew about it. Questions on the Jews. After explaining why it was on the agenda, Cardinal Bea asked for volunteers. No one answered. He then called for a coffee break, and during that time, Augustinian Gregory Baum went up to the Cardinal in private and said that he was researching this topic and could prepare an initial report of a general nature. Actually, Gregory was preparing a book in reply to the work of Jules Isaac on the teaching of contempt which would be published in 1961. We know that Gregory did not take very long, but we had Gregory Baum here in 2010. He is also still alive. We were celebrating the 50th anniversary of this meeting, November 1960. Gregory spoke, and at dinner, Stransky said, I met Gregory 50 years ago this week. It's just an extraordinary experience. We know that Gregory did not take long to contact Monsignor John Oesterreicher at Seton Hall University. We have found their correspondence in Oesterreicher's archives. And Gregory admitted it too. Oesterreicher, whom Stransky has described as the one who worked the hardest on the text, certainly on number four, would eventually join Baum as a consultor to the Secretariat, but not until the third plenary of April 1961. Baum was one of 12 signatories of a report that Monsignor Oesterreicher prepared to be sent to the Preparatory Commission for the Council in 1960. Oesterreicher's report suggested three points. One, that the Council will inquire into the nature of the Church so that the Church sees herself prefigured in the salvation history of the Jews and from the call of Abraham through the Exodus to Judaism into which Jesus was born. Two, that the church will follow the example of the Patriarchate of Jerusalem and establish votive masses or a universal feast of the just of the Old Testament. That the Council Three will correct even the lessons of the divine office, giving any impression of the hatred of the people, quoting Romans 9, 5, the human stock from which Christ came. Now, Nostra Aetate IV includes points one and two, Three, giving a solid yes to both. Regarding a feast of the just of the Old Testament, the Secretariat forwarded that to the Liturgy Commission. And a kind way to put it for the non-answer from both the Secretariat and Commission is not at this time. I'm reminded of a comment by John Palakowski at the conference we convened at Georgetown last May. This is number three, Gerard, okay, this reference to your conference. Vatican II remembering the future, that in the past 50 years, an insufficient number of readings from the Jewish scriptures, in his view, have made it into the lectionary. Well, after consulting Osterreicher, Baum sent an English copy of his first, own, his first report of his own to Cardinal Bea in January of 61. Father Stransky recalls an informal presentation by Baum a sort of briefing at the second plenary, after hours, on three points to keep in mind as the project goes forward. His first point combines the prefiguring of the church in Israel with its implication, quote, showing how the new covenant ratifies, renews, and transcends the old covenant, but does not invalidate the Old Testament. The second and third points were implicit to previous discussions involving Oesterreicher, Baum, Jules Isaac, and others. The second and third points are, one, or two, it should be said that Jesus Christ, the Savior of all humanity, 
was welcomed and received by a holy remnant of the Jewish people so that it is untrue and unscriptural to regard the Jews as an accursed race or a rejected people. Three, it should be proclaimed that the church cherishes the never waning hope for Israel's ultimate reconciliation and that until then the Christian's attitude towards the Jewish neighbor must be one of love, respect, and final expectation. Anti-Semitism must be condemned. Nostra Aetate gives a yes to these points. In fact, you might say Nostra Aetate 4 makes three major points. One, the Israel of old is intimately linked to the church and that the old covenant with Israel has not been revoked by the new covenant embodied in the church. Two, that Jesus, his mother, the apostles, and the apostolic church were both Jewish, were all Jewish, and thus not all of Judaism rejected Jesus. And three, that the Jewish people then and today are not a cursed and a cursed race and guilty of the death of Jesus. Father Stransky remarked on these three points and said, indeed, this is what Nostra Aetate IV accomplishes, these three points, at a dinner we had here at Georgetown in 2010. Another major, uh, another source needs to be acknowledged. The emergency meeting of Christians and Jews that met in Seelisberg, Switzerland in 1947 to address the serious task at hand for the churches in the aftermath of the Shoah. One of its working groups summarized the task of the churches in 10 points, which came to be known as the 10 points of Seelisberg. You might say that Nostra Aetate gives a resounding yes to nine and a half of these 10 points when made into questions. Does the one God speak to J Christians and Jews to the New and Old Testaments? In 1947, the full implication of this was about to be contested in the realm of international relations and politics with the establishment of the State of Israel. For Jews believe that God speaks to them in the Torah and promises the land to them as a sign of the covenant. So you might say that this controversial point, though Christians wish to give a resounding yes to the spiritual fecundity of the Old Testament, has to be qualified. Nostra Aetate sought to avoid every reference to the land. Two, was Jesus a Jew and does his love and forgiveness embrace his own people as well as the whole world? Yes. Were the first martyrs and apostles Jews? Yes. Is the fundamental commandment to love God and one's neighbor already proclaimed in the Old Testament, binding on both Jews and Christians? Yes. Can the gospel of Christ be proclaimed and the church extolled without misrepresenting biblical or post-biblical Judaism? Yes. Is, in, is it incorrect to say that Jews were in exclusively enemies of Jesus and thus conclude that the enemies of Jesus include the whole people of Judaism? This is incorrect. Yes. Can the passion of Jesus be proclaimed without charging the death of Jesus to the whole Jewish people or exclusively to Jews? Yes. Does Jesus' act of asking the Father to forgive his persecutors outweigh scriptural curses or any cry for his blood to be upon them and their children by the mob of Jewish witnesses? Yes. Is it wrong to argue that because of the passion and death of Jesus, Jews are an accursed and sinful people destined to suffer without end? Yes, it is wrong. Were not Jews the first members of the church, members of the following of Jesus? Yes. The first and second sections of Nostra Aetate also give positive answers to questions about other religions in light of what the text points out is already evident in scripture, that God's providence manifestation of goodness and saving design extends to all. That's quoting Nostra Aetate. For example, are other religions oriented towards a perception of God? Yes. Are there elements in the religions, in, uh, are there 
elements in the religions that God appears to be using to save people. Yes. Thus the church exhorts her sons and daughters to recognize, preserve, and foster the good things, spiritual and moral, as well as the sociocultural values found among the followers of other religions. Yes. Does this urging include conversations and collaboration with them, with prudence and love and in witness to the Christian faith and life? Yes. Nostra Aetate observes that religions everywhere respond to human restlessness and the desire to know God through the development of teachings, ways, ethical rules, and solemn rites. There is a noticeable shift between the paragraphs two and three in this text. Nostra Aetate II speaks of religions. Numbers three and four refer specifically to Muslims and Jews. Nostra Aetate III, in addition, refers to the faith of Islam. Thus to the question, is Islam just another world religion or is Judaism just another world religion? Nostra Aetate, by its structure, language, and content, says no. To the questions, do Muslims worship the one God? Nostra Aetate says yes. In fact, Nostra Aetate affirms that Christians should respect Muslims specifically for three and a half of the five pillars, faith in God, prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. Not mentioned are the prophecy of Muhammad and the Hajj, or pilgrimage to Mecca. To the questions, do Muslims live upright lives? The answer again is yes. Yet Muslims look at number three and say that the two most important features of Islam, the Quran and the prophecy of Muhammad, are absent from the text. These are among key questions that Dan Madigan identifies as those Nostra Aetate chose not to address. He and others have engaged in long discussions of these topics, just sorting out the proper questions. Because as Dan has often said, the term prophet ricochets around the scripture in a variety of meanings. I am of the view that we cannot address the question of the Quran without further developing a development of the theology of revelation issuing from Vatican II. Nostra Aetate IV makes clear that there is no room for le legitimate anti-Jewish teaching for what is essential to Christian faith is that, quote, God holds the Jews most dear for the sake of their fathers he does not repent of the gifts he makes or revoke the call he issues. Such is the witness of the apostle, citing Romans 11 and Lumen Gentium, promulgated a year earlier at the third session of Vatican II. Questions asked, but not answered in Nostra Aetate. To every question that arose in the text and its writing, there was not always an answer. While Nostra Aetate cited several scriptural passages and two tradition, traditional passages, Gregory VII and Lumen Gentium, which had just joined tradition, it gave a very limited answer to any question about resources in scripture and tradition to support a positive assessment of other religions. In a sense, Nostra Aetate left much work to scripture scholars and to those who study the first centuries of Christianity. It begs that question, which it does not answer. Why these passages and not others? They clearly chose not to use certain passages. In 2002, the Pontifical Biblical Commission published the rather remarkable study, The Jewish People and Their Sacred Scriptures in the Christian Bible. In the pre preface, then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger drew attention to a conclusion reached quote, of great importance for the pursuit of dialogue, namely that the Christian hermeneutic of the Old Testament, admittedly very different from that of Judaism, again, quote, corresponds nevertheless to a potentiality of meaning effectively present in the text, end of quote. I think that is positive. At a conference this fall on Nostra Aetate hosted by the Lubar Institute, at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. John Palakowski again referred to section 21 of the Pontifical Biblical Commission text as a contribution. 
where the commission concludes that any emphasis on discontinuity between the testaments should not lead to one-sided spiritualization. Here's that passage. What was accomplished in Christ must yet be accomplished in us and in the world. The definitive fulfillment will be at the end with the resurrection of the dead, a new heaven and a new earth. Jewish messianic expectation is not in vain. It can, be, it, it can become, for us, Christian, a powerful stimulant to keep alive the eschatological dimension of our faith. Like them, we too live in expectation. The difference is that for one, for us, the one who is to come will have the traits of Jesus, who has already come and is already present and active among us. Now, considerable progress has been made in biblical studies in the past 50 years, especially to the growth of the number of Jewish scholars of the New Testament as evidence in the Jewish annotated New Testament, which I now understand is being prepared for a second edition. Problems remain, of course. We have already alluded to the fact uh, of the question, is the covenant a continuing source of spiritual fecundity for the Jewish people? Nostra Aetate could only give a partial yes, not wanting to raise the question of the land uh, in light of the toxic Middle East issues that could have reduced the text to a footnote of Vatican II at any time. Yet while the council did not address the state of Israel directly, the question surrounded the writing of the text, though the text could not address it. It was the cause of the first draft's removal from the agenda, even before the council got underway. It was also the major question that constituted what I call the fourth and final major crisis that the text had to endure, a possible, a threatened boycott by Middle East bishops. By the end of no uh, November 1964, it was clear that the text was going to come out. Cardinal Cicignani, the Vatican Secretary of State, urged Cardinal Bea to prepare an article for L'Observatorio Romano, pointing out what the text does not state. The article appeared in the November 30th, December 1st issue of 1964. The next day, December 2nd, on his way to India, Pope Paul stopped in Lebanon to be received by that country's president, Charles Elou, a Maronite, who himself had organized Eastern bishops in negative statements against the text. And then in 1965, three, uh, um, three goodwill trips were undertaken in March, April, and July by representatives of the Secretariat to Eastern Catholic bishops in Lebanon, Syria, Jerusalem, uh, uh, Egypt, and Palestine. Truly, Nostra Aetate raises the question of the state of Israel in its genesis and development without mentioning it. Recognition of the state of Israel by the Holy See did not come until the end of 1993. An important Arab Christian leader associated with the Middle East Council of Churches at a conference in this room in 1993 said the recognition came too soon. In 1974, almost 10 years after Nostra Aetate, Pope Paul established the Pontifical Commission for Religious Relations with Jews and a similar body for relations with Muslims for the implementation of the conciliar text. The Commission on Religious Relations with Jews issued a document in 1985, Notes on the Correct Way to Present Jews and Judaism in Preaching and Catechesis. That text, 20 years after Nostra Aetate, finally mentioned the State of Israel. The existence, quote, of the State of Israel and its political options should not be envisaged should be envisaged, rather, not in a perspective which is in itself religious, but in their reference to the common principles of international law. Other references were more subtle in the document. The 1998 statement of the Pontifical Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, we remember, a reflection on the Shoah, contains a reference to the State of Israel. 
which has honored Catholic bishops, priests, religious, and laity who did help to save Jewish lives as much as was in their power, even to the point of placing their own lives in danger. This text also reminds us that the first document of this commission in 1674, Guidelines and Suggestions for Implementing the Conciliar Declaration Nostra Aetate, accomplished something that Nostra Aetate nine years earlier could not do, namely to mention the term Israel in relation to the mystery and identity of the church. Quote, the problem of Jewish-Christian relations concerns the church as such, since it is when, quote, pondering her own mystery, she encounters the mystery of Israel. In Nostra Aetate, the word Israel does not appear even to identify the people who received the covenant and brought forth Jesus. Nostra Aetate certainly raised the question of Jewish culpability for the death of Jesus. The text does not answer the question as to how much culpability for the death of Jesus did Jews have in those historical circumstances. Paul VI's sermon on Passion Sunday, 1965, April 4, in which he said that the Jewish people not only did not acknowledge Christ when he came, but also abused and killed him, caused enormous reaction. The opposition took courage. The secretariat issued a statement. The Pope was addressing the gospel passage for that day. Unjustified resentment is dangerous. History is history. And today and in the future, let us acknowledge the roots of Christianity and Judaism. End of quote. The episode was prophetic for how resentments and breakdowns and trust were not going away once and for all with the promulgation of this text. In Nostra Aetate III, um, observes that the faith of Islam is gladly linked to Abraham. Furthermore, the text points out that Muslims revere Jesus as a prophet, honor Mary, his virgin mother, at times, they even call on her with devotion and look forward to the day of judgment. Nostra Aetate raises the question, indirectly though, but almost begs the question, is the faith of Muslims based on biblical revelation? Fifteen years ago, a declaration from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, remember its name, uh, Peter? Um, Dominus Jesus seemed to want to answer this question definitively in August 2000. After self-referentially, thank you, Father Juan Carlos, for that important reference, self-referentially citing the catechism of the Catholic Church, quote, we must believe in no one, in no one God, in one God only, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. The text gives this paragraph. For this reason, the distinction between the theological faith and belief in the other religions must be firmly held. If faith is the acceptance and grace of revealed truth, which, quote, makes it possible to penetrate the mystery in a way that allows us to understand it coherently, then belief in the other religions is that sum of experience and thought that constitutes the human treasury of wisdom and religious aspiration which man in his search for truth has conceived and acted upon in his relationship with God and the absolute. Dominus Jesus is problematic for one reason, because it does not clarify if Jews are capable of theological faith, especially given that the paragraph concludes from a statement of Trinitarian faith. Dominus Jesus caused considerable turmoil in Jewish Catholic relations for several years. That's why we had the conference here. That one reference runs entirely counter to the developing consciousness of Jews and Christians regarding what has been called the parting of the ways, the gradual separation of Christianity out of Judaism. Here is a passage, that passage I'm referring to. Quote, it was in the awareness of the one universal gift of salvation offered by the Father through Jesus Christ in the Spirit that the first Christians encountered the Jewish people, showing them the fulfillment of salvation that went beyond the law, and in the same awareness they confronted the pagan world of their time, 
which aspired to salvation through a plurality of saviors. End of quote. The language of Dominus Jesus is sloppy. Nostra Aetate seems to suggest the very opposite picture of things. Avery Dulles suggested that this passage contradicts another conciliar text, Ad Gentes, the decree on missionary activities. He pointed out especially a statement in number seven of that document. Therefore, though God in ways unknown to himself can lead those inculpably ignorant of the gospel to find the face without which it is impossible to please him. And quotes Hebrews 11.6. In another place, Dominus Jesus dismisses the prayers and rituals of other religions, presumably including those worthy of preservation and fostering by Nostra Aetate. Quote, one cannot attribute to these, however, a divine origin or an ex opere operato salvific efficacy which is proper to the Christian sacraments, referring to a decree of the Council of Trent on the sacraments. Pope Francis offered his own commentary in 2013 in Evangelii Gaudium. He said, while these lack the meaning and efficacy of the sacraments instituted by Christ, they be can become channels which the Holy Spirit raises up in order to liberate non-Christians from atheistic emanationism or from purely individual religious experiences the same spirit everywhere brings forth various forms of practical wisdom which help people to bear suffering and to live in a greater peace and harmony. Christians, we can also benefit from these treasures built up over many years, which can help us better to live our own beliefs. Hooray. Pope Francis' question of practical wisdom seems to be more carefully worded for the cooperation and sharing that Nostra Aetate had in mind. His practical wisdom would apply to the whole area that has not been addressed by wise observers in 1965. Would they have predicted interfaith marriages? At the time of the composition of Nostra Aetate III by four priests, one Dominican, George Anawati, two missionaries of Africa, Joseph Kwok and Robert Cosper, and a diocesan priest from Lebanon, Jean Corbon. There was some uncertainty on how much to say about the place of Islam in the line of biblical revelation. They felt obliged in 1964 to compose a memorandum or modus in the language of, of Vatican II reacting to misinformation about Muslim and Islam already in other conciliar drafts and discussions. These four recognize that biblical revelation is, quote, materially present in the Islamic tradition, in the Quran and so forth, but that the goal of this material is not to make men and women sons and daughters of God, if that is what unites Jews and Christians. Those experts in 1964 concluded that it is best to follow the plan of the newly released encyclical of Paul VI, Ecclesium Suum, quote, where Muslims are not directly drawn together with Jews outside the other forms of monotheism, but hold among these a preferential place. They were cautious. The pattern persisted from the encyclical through the dogmatic constitution on the church and the decree on ecumenism to Nostra Aetate itself. These three texts, as the encyclical of Paul VI, are ecclesiological and not Christological in their approach to other religions. However, the approach it raises, yet, however, that approach raises yet another question, a second order question, not considered in the writing 50 years ago. Who is the church? This is an unanswered question for, of the decree on ecumenism that spills over into Nostra Aetate. Nostra Aetate left no doubt that the followers of other religions can be saved. This was not new when one considered God's grace acting on individuals and their responses to it. Francis A. Sullivan, who has written in depth on magisterial teaching on the followers of other religions and salvation, considers the implications of Nostra Aetate that individuals 
are not saved in spite of their religions, but because of them has been part of his work. John Paul II pointed this out in his 1991 encyclical on mission, Redemptoris Missio, paragraph 55, that God works through other religions. John Paul II's earlier reflections on his own experiences with the followers of other religions, principally at the World Days of Peace in Assisi, led to his development that this salvific action takes place through the Holy Spirit, active in the heart of everyone. In a recent article, Vatican II and the post conciliar Magisterium on Salvation of the Adherents of Other Religions, published in 2012, Sullivan suggests that because Muslim faith is based in part on biblical revelation, no matter how Muslims receive that revelation, that they are in a different condition than the followers of those other religions with whom the present Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue relates. Now, finally, questions not asked in Nostra Aetate, but raised by Nostra Aetate, including certain ambiguities. Nostra Aetate used the term religion in a positive way, in that the drafters borrowed the usage from contemporary anthropological and history of religion study. Such was the testimony of Father Stransky. Yes, Nostra Aetate offers no definition of religion, but use the term as though there exists a religious pluralism. Fortunately, there was no intervention that spoiled this development, as in the case of Dignitatis Humanae, the Declaration on Religious Liberty, an incident that angered John Courtney Murray. Stransky is my source on that too. In the second paragraph of Dignitatis Humanae, number one, we find the sentence, we believe that this one true religion subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church in which the Lord Jesus Christ committed the duty of spreading it abroad among all men." End of quote. That would have spoiled everything in Nostra Aetate. The framers avoided the discussion among scholars on what is religion, a debate that continues today. Nostra Aetate referred to what is true and holy in other religions, but did not define what is true and holy. These were questions left open. Yves Congar participated in the expansion of the text to include these passages, but cautioned that some small statement of Christian faith needed to balance the acknowledgement of truth and holiness in other religions. They settled on this, quote, indeed she proclaims and ever must proclaim Christ as, quote, the way, the truth, and the life John 14, 6, in whom men and women may find the fullness of religious life and to whom God has reconciled all things to himself, end of quote. Adding a further reference to Corinthians 5, 18, 19. When I asked Father Stransky why this passage was chosen, his response today is the passage is out of place. A result of one of those compromises caused by the myriad of hands writing the text. To some, this does not follow logically in the paragraph. To others, this is a self referential acceptance of truth and holiness in other religions. Nostra Aetate gave no answers to these unasked questions. On deeper reflections, we come to the fundamental question on the relationship between mission and interreligious dialogue. One of the reasons why an attempt by council leadership, what I call the third crisis, to break up the text into pieces and scatter them in other documents, namely the portion on the Jews put in the dogmatic constitution on the church, the portion condemning anti-Semitism and discrimination in the tightly battled draft on the church in the modern world, and the references to other religions in the draft on the missions. Well, one of the answers is, the, the last draft was in terrible shape as late as October 1964. For two years, missionary bishops were fighting a pitched battle with the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. No progress had been made. Eventually, the 1965 decree on missionary activity, Agentes, left the question wide open. So the Secretariat for Non-Christians, nowadays the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, issued two important reflections on mission and dialogue. 
1984 and 1991. These were its best work, though the latter text, dia uh, Dialogue and Proclamation, had to be written with the Congregation for the Evangelization of the Peoples, Propaganda's Post-Conciliar Incarnation, and later on with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. When the Office of Interreligious Dialogue could draw upon the testimony of missionaries and those living dialogue worldwide, it created its best work. I would say, though, that the relationship between mission and dialogue remains unresolved with no real consensus for a basic reason because both mission and dialogue are terms that are so multivalent. Nowadays, Pope Francis has introduced through example and exhortation the theme of spiritual accompaniment and companionship, giving us a new opportunity to reflect on mission and dialogue. In Evangelii Gaudium, he refers to how, quote, the sacramental dimension of sanctifying grace, God's working in them, that is, the followers of other religions, tends to produce signs and rites and sacred expressions, which in turn brings others to communitarian experience of journeying towards God, making reference to Proposition 55 of the Senate on the New Evangelization. So stay tuned. I'm sure there's more to come on mission and dialogue from Pope Francis. Some might suggest today that even Nostra Aetate 1 and 2 seem naive. Current religious studies would point out the patronizing, colonial attitude in the language. Even the questions asked in Nostra Aetate I may, seem, may not serve as unifying opening of a text were such attempted today. Is an essentialist definition of religion at work here, some might ask. What about the growing number of people who do not affiliate with religions today but have questions? And they're rather concerned about these questions. How do I live into dying? How does one get the energy to live? These ultimate questions are, their ultimate questions are about loneliness, sex, health, and security. Nostra Aetate urged dialogue, but the, its framers knew that dialogue would become more evident in the practice. This was true even for the lengthier and more substantial decree on ecumenism which the same team of bishops and consultors produced. In 1980, Pope John Paul II questioned the, the tiny Catholic community of Ankara, Turkey, that is it not about time that we explored the spiritual bonds that connect us with Muslims? Nostra Aetate explicitly raised the question of spiritual bonds with Jews, and I will say more about that by way of conclusion. But the question was eventual for Muslims and all the rest. Nostra Aetate encouraged the promotion of spiritual values, but gave no direction for spiritual sharing and interreligious prayer. The days of prayer in Assisi that John Paul II pioneered and clearly considered emblems of his papacy were probably the most visible implementation of the text. Prayer together is something ordinary people find inclined to do. Yet considerable ink, last night Peter said, oceans of ink, have been spilled in the past 50 years on false syncretisms and worries about relativizing the faith by too much dabbling in one another's practices. These are unanswered questions raised by the implementation of Nostra Aetate. In the second paragraph of number three, we find this sentence, this sacred synod, and Francis Sullivan taught me, when the a Vatican II text says that, listen up. This is the work he writes about. This sacred synod pleads with all to forget the past, and yet Nostra Aetate naively made no provision for healing of memory. This was a later theme of John Paul II, addressed succinctly in his World Day of Peace message 2002. No peace without justice, no justice without forgiveness. Before that, in the preparation for the great Jubilee year 2000, this was a regular theme. I have often considered the healing of memory to be a correction of the pleading in number three. So my conclusion, perhaps the largest unanswered question in the writing of Nostra Aetate was that of the Shoah. 
It was the reason why Jules Isaac arrived in Rome for the audience with Pope John. When the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity met in Buell, near the Black Forest, not far from Cardinal Bea's family home in August 1961, the capture of Adolf Eichmann the previous May and the news of the intention of Ben-Gurion for a public trial had already caused a major soul-searching undertaken by the German church. When the Secretariat held its most difficult meeting in May 1965 with the threatened boycott of Middle East Christian bishops regarding the future of the text, due to this strong resistance, Stransky reports that the plea of Bishop Stangle of Heidelberg for a strong text encouraged the Secretariat to continue. Otherwise, he said, the bishops of the German church would feel greatly defeated in their efforts of self-examination. Yet while Beyes, Beyes Relaciones, or introductions, would, would mention the fact of the show up, it was far too soon for the text to raise the question for any consequential discussion. It might even have caused more resentment. Remember that Rolf Hochhuth, the deputy, der Stellenwetter, premiered in Berlin, suggesting the complicity of Pius XII in the Holocaust on the 20th of February, 1963, just as Oesterreicher, Baum, and Stransky and others were putting, gathering to put a text on the Jews back on the council's agenda. The statement of the Commission for Religious Relations with Jews, we remember 35 years later in 1998, itself caused considerable concern, requiring a lengthy footnote in an attempt to articulate in an acceptable way how Pius XII addressed the historical events. If anything, the writing of Nostra Aetate provided an opportunity for the Catholic Church to state, even if indirectly, that anti-Jewish attitudes and teachings promoted in the past indeed needed to be addressed and corrected apart from the condemnation of anti-Semitism, which already had existed in Catholic magisterium. No longer were Catholics to define their faith in any anti-Jewish way. Though the Shoah still remains and may always remain unaddressed to anyone's satisfaction, the reception of this principle was probably the greatest answer of Nostra Aetate. All other questions, answered and unanswered, pale by comparison. Many such questions orbit around this fundamental principle that we will not define our faith in an anti-Jewish way. How are Jews of the new people of God, how are Jew, Jews of the new people of God, or was there a radical schism within the church or within Israel? That is, was the first schism within Judaism? What is the nature of the common messianic and eschatological hope between Jews and Christians? When the church does not draw sustenance from the root of Judaism, is it less church? Apart from the controversy of Christian mission and relations with Jews, what is the continuing mission of the synagogue to the church? Can there be a one-way spiritual bondedness with Jews, with Muslims, with any others? With this fundamental principle, unanswered questions regarding Jews and the history of Jewish relations expand. How grave is the sin of anti-Semitism or any form of anti-discrimination? How can religions be misused? In 2006, Stransky wrote a reflection on Nostra Aetate's genesis and development and how it preserved this fundamental principle. He said, I remain convinced also that the enlargement through the inclusion of other religions protected the Jewish theme intact and its opponents as well as its supporters knew it. The gem could not be removed from the larger setting and its fragments scattered about in other texts. But by only these 17 Latin sentences in number four, 
though a few had been wounded by immediate compromises, Vatican II began to shift with integrity 1,900 years of relationships between Catholics and Jews and to open locks that had been jammed for centuries. The Conciliar Act continues an irrevocable Heshbon Ha Nefesh, a reconsideration of soul. Thank you. Thank you, John, for a very rich paper, uh, which I think we're all going to want to study when you uh, release it. Um, those questions are really quite a remarkable way to organize the history of the document and, and its un unanswered questions. <coughs> Our first respondent <coughs> is Professor Peter Fahn, professor of theology and holder of the A. A. Career Chair in Catholic Social Thought. It's one of my real pleasures to have him here because I was on the search committee that brought him here many years ago. Peter. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank John Borelli for this marvelous presentation. Uh, the way he organized uh, the uh, substance of the Solidarity in a three series of questions, questions asked and answered, questions asked but not answered, and questions not asked and therefore not answered. So I like it very much. I had the opportunity to read the longer version of his presentation. So. Um, John is uh, my junior by six months, um, but he is, looks much wiser and, of course, much older. <laughs> I have been given ten minutes to respond, and so, although God has, in his mercy, has spared me from being a Jesuit, <laughs> I'd like to organize my presentation, my response, in three points. My first point is to show the distance or even the abyss separating what goes before Vatican II and what goes after Vatican II. You remember years ago there was this debate about the hermeneutics of continuity and the hermeneutics of disruption or discontinuity. I don't want to go into that, but just to show you whether it's continuity or discontinuity, Allow me to read a very short statement from Pope Eugenius IV, proclaimed at the Council of Florence in 1442, and Nostra Aetate in 1965. In a period of 523 years, this is what happened. Eugenius IV declared at the uh, Council of Florence, I, wrote, I, I read to you, the Holy Roman Church firmly believes, professes, and teaches that the legal statutes of the Old Testament or Mosaic, Mosaic law divided into ceremonies, holy sacrifices, and sacraments were instituted to signify something to come. And therefore, although in that age they were fitting for divine worship, they have ceased with the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom they signified. This is what Jules Isaac referred to as the teaching of contempt. And again, I continue. But the church asserts that after the promulgation of the gospel, they cannot be observed without the loss of eternal salvation. Therefore, she denounces as foreign to the faith of Christ all those who up to that time observe circumcision, the Sabbath, and other laws. And she asserts that they can in no way be sharers of eternal salvation unless they sometime turn away from these errors. Was it an infallible teaching? And then, of course, you have Nostra Aetate. So it is within this context that I think we should appreciate what Vatican II was doing. 
whether it was a parad paradigm shift, as Faris Canone said last night wonderfully, or whether it's simply a development, historical development. But there's no avoiding the fact that Vatican II represents a turnaround of the relations of Christianity towards Judaism, and of course, later on, as the text goes on in Osaritate, with other religions and with uh, Muslim. Having that context, then I'd like to go to my second point. John has mentioned a questions not asked, but I'd like to dwell in one point. The title itself of the document, in spite of all the magnificent progress of Nosferatu, Nosferatu in the title itself regards all the religions as non-Christians. Now, for those of us who work for a long time in Christian traditions, this term doesn't sound very offensive. But it is. If you were a Hindu, and, they, and we Christians describe them not as Hindu, but as non-Christians. And that's the way how we regard them. And, verse, and other uh, 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 religions or believers what I see in Nostra Aetate is still a residue of the theology of fulfillment that Aurélie Lubach, Daniel Lu, and even Karl Rahner, the great Karl Rahner, was proposing. And therefore, even if the theology of fulfillment, particularly in the form of Rahnerian tradition of anonymous Christianity, represents a great step forward, but it does not allow us Christians to see the other as other and not simply as the reflection of who we are and much uh, lesser reflection of who we are. We have not yet learned to see the other as other, the alterity, the alterity, and respect that. Even if theoretically we may call them saying that, well, they, 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 they do have values, they are the seeds of truth and so forth, but we have not recognized this reality. What has changed in the last 50 years that allow us now to see the other believers as others and not simply as ways towards us, as stepping stone towards Christ and the church? I think there are two, briefly. First, and John has mentioned, the experience of people who work in the missions. The people who are not in the Roman Curia, the people who are not caught up in books and libraries, but the people who work among and whose parents, whose relatives, whose siblings are not Christians, and who experience the reality of God's grace. It is this concrete grassroots experience that change the perspective of how we understand the other religions as ways to God. The second element, also John has mentioned, is the recognition of the role of the Holy Spirit, the pneumatology. Nostra Aetate is heavily ecclesiocentric, but it's also heavily Christocentric. What is lacking in there is an explicit and well-developed theology of the spirit. It is this pneumatology that we see already John Paul II, uh, a little bit, and as we develop this, we recognize that the others are also not, the Holy Spirit does not simply depend on Christ for her or his work. In the kind of linear descending Trinitarian theology, you see the Spirit cannot do anything except through the Son. But we have to reverse that order and see that the Spirit is present, outside of, differently from Jesus. It is this insight into the activity of the Spirit as outside of together with, but not dependent to, 
that allows us to recognize other religions as valid ways to God. The third point. John mentioned the one question that was not asked and was not answered is interreligious prayer at Vatican II. As we all know that there are different ways of conducting interreligious dialogue. We often say there are four ways to do it. Sharing of life, which is extremely important. Common work for justice and peace. Theological discussions. But above all is through sharing of spiritual experiences. I think it is this last mode of interreligious dialogue, which is the most challenging and yet the most transformative experiences that will give new directions to interreligious dialogue. It will give a new meaning to Nosaritata. It will open up ways of moving beyond what Nosaritata has offered. I don't know whether among us there is Thomas Ryan. Last night he was here. Are you here, Thomas? No, he promised. Okay. He is? Okay. Um, he has written a gem, a little book. It's called Interreligious Prayer. Now, I know that Thanksgiving is coming, Christmas is coming, <laughs> a birthday are coming, and you want to something for your grandparents, parents, relatives and all the Chinese in China, please <laughs> buy a copy. This is magnificent work because not only because it's not only theoretical, but he gave us examples of how we can pray together. This picapoo of religious secretism in, in, in the religious prayer has to be laid to rest. It is only when we stand side by side, shoulder by shoulder, with others, and kneeling together with other people that we can recognize that interreligious dialogue is not just simply intellectual enterprise, it is something that will transform not only those who are others, but ourselves. I'd like to end with a magnificent thing that Pope Francis has done in his encyclical Laudato Si. To my knowledge, it is the first paper encyclical that ends with two prayers. He says, after this long, long, long text on, 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 on the ecology, he said, let me, allow me to offer two prayers. The first prayer can be said by anybody, by anyone who believes in God, something transcendent. We can work, we can pray together. So that short prayer. And then the second prayer says the prayer of those who are Christians, who can pray with Jesus in the name of Jesus. Those of you who are looking for a theme for your master's degree or even doctor <laughs> dissertation, I suggest to you, lie the two prayers side by side and do a theological comparison. What difference are there? You'll get an A-plus from me. Thank you very much. I want to uh, commend Peter. Uh, you know, my own experience of uh, being with Muslims in prayer has been a, a very uh, important experience in my life, and so I, I, I welcome his comments on interreligious prayer in particular. Um, our second respondent is, is Heather uh, Miller Rubens, who uh, is a director of a center on uh, 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 interreligious activities in, in Baltimore. She's, uh, uh, to me, a new friend. Uh, we met only early in the summer at a conference on Nostra Aetate, and uh, I was so glad to meet her. Those of us who have been in ecumenical dialogue and interreligious dialogue for many years have been waiting for the next generation. Uh, and I think that uh, she really, in her work in Baltimore, has been doing wonderful, wonderful work. And uh, I'm looking forward to her, her commentary now.
Good morning. I'm delighted to be part of this conference at Georgetown University honoring Vatican II's unfinished agenda, and in particular, Nostra Aetate. It is both humbling and a bit intimidating to return to one's undergraduate alma mater and be invited to speak. And of course, it must be said that any brilliance you may hear in my response to Dr. Borelli is a direct result of my study as an undergraduate theology major here at Georgetown. <laughs> Anything you disagree with or find dubious is no doubt the result of the corrupting influences of graduate school <laughs> and living, working, and dialoguing in the world at large. Thank you, John, for the opportunity to return to the hilltop. On other occasions, I've had the privilege of hearing Dr. Borelli speak about Nostra Aetate, and he's described the document as such. Nostra Aetate is a text that's pre-dialogical in the sense that the document was promoting dialogue as the primary tool for developing its teaching. It left its major work to dialogue. It's unfinished. In this morning's lecture, John used the helpful three-part rubric to organize his presentation questions asked and answered, questions asked but not answered, questions left unsaid. Both the questions left unanswered and the questions left unasked offer possibilities in 1965 and continue to offer possibilities in 2015. The three-part structure that he used today as well as his other insight about the workings of implementing Nostra Aetate imply that there's much work to be done in both formulating new questions as well as positing some answers in the wake of Nostra Aetate. If this insight is correct, that understanding and implementing Nostra Aetate is part of the unfinished agenda highlighted at this conference, and I, I think that it is, then the next important question involves who. Who is tasked with the doing of this work of dialogue? Indeed, issues of identity and representation are core to the pursuit of dialogue and the ongoing development of the teaching of Nostra Aetate. Who is around the table? Who has been developing the teachings over the past 50 years? And who will do this major work going forward? Since completing my doctorate at the University of Chicago, I've been working at the ICJS, the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies um, in Baltimore. Uh, it's an independent academic nonprofit um, who engages in a variety of educational opportunities for active clergy in the region, for seminarians and rabbinical students, for adult learners, and for teachers in the Mid-Atlantic uh, to engage in interreligious dialogue. Let me give you just some brief examples of some of our programs. We've been offering an intensive uh, J-term course that brings both Protestant and Catholic seminarians from Washington, D.C. region together with Jewish rabbinical students from Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Cincinnati, and L.A. We're also beginning a new program to provide professional development and educational opportunities for high school and middle school teachers of religion, including those teachers who may be encountering religious pluralism in the study of social studies and in literature. I love my work in large part because I get to move between several distinct spheres, the academic, the ecclesial, and the public. I can attend to conferences like these donning my academic robes to dialogue with scholars of different intellectual and different religious commitments. I also get to develop and facilitate dialogue programs for active clergy, as well as clergy in formation. And I enjoy teaching members of the laity in churches, synagogues, mosques, and in our own building up in Baltimore. Moving beyond my own biography and experience with dialogue, I observe that since Nostra Aetate, there have been many different kinds of interreligious learning conducted in different spaces by different sorts of people. Again, academic dialogues between theologians, ethicists, and historians. There have been other dialogues between religious leaders, bishops and rabbis and imams gathering together for conversation and for learning. And importantly, there have been popular dialogues happening between regular, everyday people of different faith traditions. Men and women coming together to study and learn about themselves and about each other. In some, there are many different people developing and teaching Nostra Aetate, both answering the questions that were asked in the 1965 text, as well as developing their own questions in 2015. In light of this reality, I invite us to take up the following broader questions. How have these three levels of dialogue, popular, ecclesial, and academic, affected each other over the last 50 years? 
How have the bishops and rabbis influenced conversations between everyday committed believers of different faiths? And in turn, how have grassroots dialogues affected the conversations between religious leaders? And where do scholars and academics like myself fit in? How do we go forward? As I move between these dialogical spaces, I am keenly aware that I am doing so as a Roman Catholic lay woman. The facts of my gender and my position as a lay academic have both opened many doors for me and yet closed others in the world of dialogue due to the politics of representation. As we have been reminded in the past few weeks, determining who has the authority to speak on all matters Catholic in the public square is a contested space, even when it's an in-house conversation. The question of who can speak for Catholics in interreligious spaces is necessarily related. Who should stand as a representative of Roman Catholicism? Who has been and who will be involved in the development of the teachings of Nostra Aetate? But we cannot only be self-referential in this regard. These questions of representation and speaking authority translate into expectations, sometimes unreasonable or misguided, of our dialogue partners. As we gaze across the table, who are our dialogue partners? Who do we want them to be? But more importantly, who's actually there, sitting across from us at the table? I will close with that being my final remark and sort of sum up with one quick line. Who will do the work of implementing Nostra Aetate going forward and under what authorities? How do the politics of identity and representation and speaking authority, how does that ha has, has it shaped the conversation in the past and how will it shape it going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, we have time, plenty of time now for questions and, and discussion. Uh, it's a little hard up here, but I think if I shave my eyes, I can recognize people. We have a roving mic, is that correct? And is the roving mic back there? There's okay. some roving mics, so put up. So if, if I miss someone roving mic, uh, <laughs> you, you're free to, uh, to give it to someone I haven't recognized. So do we have, have a show of hands for questions or comments? There's right one there. back there, good. Hello, my name is Hélène Bossinger Chasseau, and I was uh, teaching part-time in this department a few years ago in the Department of Theology at Georgetown. I'm also an alumna at Georgetown. Uh, I would like to address the, the last question you ask: How a lay Catholic woman, would be it an academia in theology, can represent the Catholic position? This was really my challenge as I was teaching and my specialty is feminist theology because I wanted to make sure that they heard the woman's voice. And I still haven't uh, come to grip with that because after two years uh, of teaching at Georgetown, I went to another setting and I continued to live my life as a Catholic woman, un invisible. Also, I did do a, a number of uh, adult education programs in different settings. So this is one question that I would like to ask. How would the church eventually move from a male theological uh, dominated, you know, ac in academia or in the church to a more lay participative way of doing dialogues. That's the first level of dialogue as far as I'm concerned. The second dialogue, because life took me... But just in, one question, please? Yes. Just, thank you. Thank you. There's just, just a second question to uh, uh, Mr. No, Fon. just one question, okay. please. All right. Okay. okay. Do you want to take uh, that? Sure. <laughs> and in uh, response, I, you know, I, w I do what I do because I think that there's hope. And so you just have to keep showing up in a variety of settings and spaces. Um, and I think the ability to, to both write and to speak, um, you, you have to, to, to say yes to all invitations and continue to be present. Um, and I think that the voices will carry. 
And another response is this. We, we tend to look at these fishbowl um, public dialogues uh, as where it's happening, but actually very little happens there. And uh, there are various levels of dialogue in this dialogue of life and community dialogue. When the Middle East tensions cause a halt to public dialogues, usually it's the dialogue among Muslim, Jewish, and Christian women that's continuing and making progress and publishing books. And so I really think in this second 50 years of implementation of this text, I think more work is going to be done locally. We won't be looking at the fishbowl accomplishments because they can only do so much, I think. It's going to, and even bishops' conferences have less and less funds to promote the kinds of dialogues that I was fortunate to have started some years ago. I think it's this dialogues that will happen in Baltimore City and other places that will accomplish far more. And we have this return of collegiality within the church, and I think there'll be a collegiality within the spheres of dialogue. I think there was a question in the back. Uh, now there's a woman there in the back corner. I have the same question. Same question? Okay. Uh, back row. Ted Keating, uh, Drew, and John, we worked a great deal together in the past on Middle East issues here sure. in town, but you made a scant reference to that issue of the land. and. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, that can't be, couldn't have been dealt with in 1965. And the face of so much of the Jewish Christian stuff is the Middle East and what's happening politically there. I wonder if you might make some comments on what I know have been some developments among, in Jewish writing on this question of the land and if it's become more helpful now mm -hmm. than it was so many years ago. Do you want to make reference to you, more? You. Well, I just want to say this, that I think... Um, I think some of our Jewish friends who have been participating in dialogue and with whom considerable trust has been created are willing to begin to address the question how Jewish faith is expressed, including this promise of the land, but you have to address those who are already living on the land. Just as we Christians had to face the question, how can we express Christian faith in ways that's not anti-Jewish as a fundamental turnaround I think Jews are beginning to see maybe this will be a way to begin looking at this. Uh, but I, I uh, and, uh, <coughs> current scholarship. I'm well, I would also uh, bring up the fact that with uh, Protestant Christian Jewish dialogue, there's been an increase in tensions in the past few years, in particular, um, bringing up the sort of Presbyterian position on BDS. Um, as well as the UCC position on BDS, that the issue of the land, the issue that John raised, is, I think, going to be the major talking point um, between Jewish-Christian relations in the next, certainly in the next 10, 10 to 15 years. David. D David Hombach. Thank you very much. Uh, could I raise a question for probably both John Borelli and Peter Fahn? It's a theological question, and it's stimulated by John's comment that he thought that some of the issues of the relation to Islam demand uh, further development and further understanding of the theology of revelation, especially with regard to the role of the prophet of Muhammad in Islam and how that relates to Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, so the revelation emphasis that John highlighted, and then Peter's point at the end about a more spiritual relationship with not, between Christians and other traditions being in the Holy in the Spirit, which somehow reaches beyond. There's a kind of apophatic quality to the relationship to the Spirit that goes beyond words, mm -hmm. uh, and in other words, in some way beyond what might be called revelation or certainly beyond the theology of the word that we would find as an emphasis both in Judaism and Christianity about revel I, I'm, I'm interested in this. I mean, it's, mm. this is, we've got a theology of the word in Christianity, mm. but also a theology of the spirit. And uh, the two of them are not completely uh, identical. And how they, mm. uh, what I'm trying to grapple with here is how we put together the much more specific claims about who Jesus is or who Muhammad is that you would get in a sort of revelation-based 
approach to these issues versus an experiential base that is more praying together with people who are different that goes beyond those words, how this works out. Is this a direction in which we might be able to go forward about a theology of the word versus a theology mm. of the spirit or a theology of revelation versus a, a more apophatic beyond revelation Thank idea? Thank you, David. Peter? <clears throat> the first caution I'd like to make is not to draw the parallel between Jesus and the prophet. The parallel is between Jesus and the Quran. The functions that Jesus performed for Christians, that function is performed by the Quran for the Muslim and not by the prophet. So that's my first caution, not to confuse the kind of comparison that we may tend to think because they're both human beings, Jesus and the prophet. But your second aspect, your, the second aspect of your question is really drive to the heart of the issue. What constitutes revelation? Remember John's questions. And how is revelation an ongoing reality? Mm -hmm. We tend to limit revelation in a set of books, just as Muslims tend to set it in the Quran. Even verbally, it had to be in Arabic and not in other, other language. We tend to think in terms of intellectually, of course, we work in academia, we look at books, and we focus on books, and books in the case of the, of the, of the Bible. But the experience of understanding what revelation means can be in itself based on the Bible. It's a, it's a self-referential. You have to open up that book, and you cannot just simply intra-textually, just reading one page and compare another page, one text to another text and so forth, or the Old Testament versus New Testament, intra-textually, but you have to compare it intertextually, which means that when I read the Bible, I cannot read it by itself. I have to read it in, 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 in together with the Dhammapada, I have seen Leo Liffable here. Uh, he has done uh, another book that you need to buy for your parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the same thing with the book of the Dai Jing and many others. And so this understanding of revelation as an ongoing, and who is the agent of that? Hmm. To the spirit and the local community. Not some kind of authority over in the Roman Curia. They don't know. <laughs> what grassroots reality. You mentioned the uh, 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 Jesus. I know the guy who wrote it, okay? <laughs> I know him. If he had just a little bit of experience with the mission of sitting down with Muslims and Jews, and all, you would never write such a thing. Mm -hmm. It is that so I would say that to answer your question, that all go to the Holy Spirit, a local community, working together, and that is a new understanding of what's going on when God speaks to us. There, John? There's, a, uh, there's a conciliar definition someplace that Revelation ceased with the death of the last apostles. But biblical scholars have said, well, we've got some problems with that, and especially to Peter and so forth. So we've got to look at that. But I'm reminded of what Jacques Dupuis said in when he presented his book towards the theology of religious pluralism which only got the got the um, criticism by the doctrine of the faith for being ambiguous and um, when you spend two hours presenting Dominus Jesus and AP comes out with the headline only Catholics can be saved it seems that charge is against CDF also but Jock said God, from the beginning, op, uh, entered into the life of humanity through word and spirit. And with the appearance of Christ, God didn't cease that. It continued. So how do we work with that? And um, I think if we take now this new text, it's not so new, 1998, is it? The, the Pontifical Biblical Commission, and start drawing some of the implications from this text and try to expand our theology of revelation, then we can get around to talking about uh, the Quran and so forth. But uh, the, when Francis Sullivan, who's not exactly a raving liberal, 
can say that I, I'm not going to consider Islam when I'm talking about other religions here because it is based in part on biblical revelation. Well, it is, in the oral tradition at least, uh, to which Muhammad was, was, was subject. So I think we can talk about it, but we've got to take on the deeper question of theology of revelation, and I agree with Peter, the directions he gives. It's time for the break. I want to we can take one more. Take one more, okay. Let me see if there's someone on this back there. Yes. There we go. Nope. Hello, my name is Paula McCabe. I'm a parishioner at Holy Trinity, and I'm pleased to be here among other parishioners. My question um, relates to um, the impact that you expect and the contribution that you would expect from uh, interreligious families, especially couples. Um, this has been hinted at, it's, uh, you know, in all of the remarks, but um, beyond sort of more obvious things, what, what hope or expectation do you have for this sector um, in terms of impact and contribution mm -hmm. to dialogue and um, uh, prayer together, among mm -hmm. other things? Thank you. Do you do much work in Baltimore with interfaith couples? Um, Yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I hate to give a sort of pessimistic response, but I think I'm, I'm going to. Not on the far part of the interreligious families, but on a part of the religious community's ability to begin theologizing about interreligious families. I think that those questions have really yet to be fully explored, and so there's not a lot of resources um, for, for thinking about what does it mean to be an interreligious family and then how does it uh, affect um, what it means to be a community and a particular member of a community. Um, I think in, in Baltimore in particular, um, we did a program on interreligious marriage and families and the comfort level on the part of the clergy that were present in the room was to present this is a Catholic view of marriage, this is a Jewish view of marriage, this is, and to, to, to sort of explore and explain what the sort of ideal form of marriage was, and then to be anxious about the interreligious um, component of, of families that may be in their communities. Um, and so I, th I think to a certain extent interreligious families can feel abandoned um, leading up to the marriage and then also dealing with the birth of a first child. But then there's a sort of a desire on the part of communities to reach out and try to scoop them back in. And sometimes it may seem a little, it may be a little bit too late or seem disingenuous. Um, but I think that you are right to raise it as a, a sort of major place for future thinking and future dialogue. I, I think, uh, well, first of all, you have the problem that the rabbinic councils in the United States have asked the Catholic Church, don't do it, don't allow mm -hmm. it. And so you don't, you, you have uh, very few rabbis that are there to be, to go with the couple. Uh, at the same time, um, one out of three Jewish adults marries a non-Jew. So, and the other two marry each other. Mm -hmm. So half of their marriages, <laughs> <laughs> half of, Half of their marriages are with uh, non-Jews, mm -hmm. which is why Jewish population mm -hmm. has remained very much the same. And there are worries. There are worries about the preservation of the faith. But I think this is the future. I know my wife and I uh, take a round of marriage prep in the parish every year. And one year with the coordinator of the parish, we just had an open night for interfaith marriages. We were mobbed by people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a hunger to address this. And I think it... The couple will have to live out the relationship mm -hmm. of the two traditions, and they're going to have to, and, and for each kind of couple, there are different questions to ask about living that, and it just takes time and expertise mm -hmm. and dedication and support, which um, we always don't seem to have the time for, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think that's, it's definitely going to happen, so. Uh, quickly, uh, one of our doctoral students here, Erica Seaman, uh, did her dissertation on precisely interreligious uh, uh, marriages. So I would recommend again that, because our doctoral program here, if I make a little bit of uh, propaganda for it, is to bring about the encounter study of two different distinct religious traditions, and within this context, that she does the study of interreligious marriage in the United States. Uh, but it, it is the Asian bishop 
who brought up the issues of interreligious marriage at the Synod of the, on the family recently. Because why else do you have this? It is not an exception, it is the norm. When you are only about, oh, maybe five, six percent of the entire population, uh, and you look around for a husband and wife, you are not looking at like Christians or Catholics, you're looking at the other side. So it is, again, I appeal to the concrete grassroots experiences. It is these families who live their lives, Buddhist Christians, Buddhist Hindus, and uh, uh, Christian Hindus mostly, it is gradually, it is their, their children who grow up and it is in their families that they say, this is not an abstract issue. It is a lived issue and we will work out how we can preserve both our faith. And so they go to the temple, you know, like we say in Japan, you are born a Shinto, you uh, live as a, uh, you, you marry as a Christian, and you die as a Buddhist, because at each time there are wonderful celebrations for each ritual of this. <laughs> <laughs> Join me in thanking all our speakers.